STS-129, ISS Assembly Flight ULF-3, was a NASA Space Shuttle mission to the International Space Station ISS. Atlantis was launched on November 16, 2009 at 1428 Eastern Standard Time, and landed at 944 Eastern Standard Time on November 27, 2009 on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center's Shuttle Landing Facility. STS-129 focused on staging spare components outside the station. The 11-day flight included three spacewalks. The payload bay carried two large express logistics carriers holding two spare gyroscopes, two nitrogen tank assemblies, two pump modules, an ammonia tank assembly, a spare latching end effector for the station's robotic arm, a spare trailing umbilical system for the mobile transporter, and a high-pressure gas tank. STS-129 was the first flight of an express logistics carrier. The completion of this mission left six Space Shuttle flights remaining until the end of the Space Shuttle program, after STS-135 was approved in February 2011. Topic. Crew Topic. Crew seat assignments Topic. Mission payload Topic. Express Logistics Carriers 1 and 2 The primary payload of STS-129 was the Express, Expedite the Processing of Experiments to the Space Station, Logistics Carrier ELC-1, and the ELC-2. The mass capacity of each ELC is 9,800 pounds 4,400 kilograms, with a volume of 30 meters cubed, total with spares, ELC-1, 13,850 pounds 6,280 kilograms, and ELC-2, 13,400 pounds 6,100 kilograms. Goddard Space Flight Center served as the overall integrator for ELC-1 and ELC-2. The spare hardware stored on ELC-1 includes an ammonia tank assembly, a battery charger discharge unit, a station, robotic arm latching end effector, a control moment gyroscope, a nitrogen tank assembly, a pump module, a plasma contactor unit and two empty passive flight releasable attachment mechanisms. ELC-2 was launched with an oxygen-filled high-pressure gas tank HPGT, a cargo transport container CTC-1, a mobile transporter trailing umbilical system reel assembly MT -TUSRA, a control moment gyroscope, a nitrogen tank assembly, a pump module, MISSE attach hardware and one empty site for future payloads. ELC-1 was installed on the unpressurized cargo carrier attachment system number 2 UCCAS-2 on the P3 port side segment of the main truss. ELC-2 was installed on the upper outboard payload attached system on the S3 starboard segment 3 of the main truss. Topic Materials on International Space Station Experiment MISSE, Carrier ELC-2 also carried MISSE-7, an experiment that will expose a variety of materials and coatings being considered for future spacecraft to the extreme conditions outside the space station. The materials are being evaluated for the effects of atomic oxygen, ultraviolet, direct sunlight, radiation, and extremes of heat and cold. The experimental findings will benefit better understanding, development and to test new materials suitable to better withstand the rigors of space environments with applications in the design of future spacecraft. MISS A7 is composed of two suitcase-sized passive experiment containers PECs, identified as MISS A7A and MISS A7B. Once installed in the exterior of ISS by space-walking astronauts, the PECs are opened. 
The orientation of Miss A7A will be space facing, Earth facing, while Miss A7B will face forward, backward relative to the ISS orbit. Both Miss A7A and Miss A7B contain active and passive experiments. Passive experiments are designed for pre- and post-flight evaluation in ground-based laboratories. Topic: <laughs> S-band antenna subassembly (SASA) package. Atlantis delivered a repaired S-band antenna subassembly (SASA) to the ISS, which was returned to Earth during the STS-120 mission in October 2007. SASA is a space station antenna assembly consisting of Assembly Contingency Radio Frequency Group (RFG) or ACRFG, SASA boom. Avionics wire harness Muir functions of the ACRFG are to transmit, receive radio signals to, from the transponder, amplification of signals to a power level necessary to be acquired by a tracking data and relay satellite and to broadcast, receive signals through the selected antenna. The SASA boom assembly consists of a mast, an extra vehicular activity, EVA, handle, a harness, a connector panel, a mounting surface for the RFG and a baseplate fitting. The fitting will serve as the structural interface for mounting the SASA to the Zenith 1 truss on the ISS. The avionics wire harness installed on the SASA boom provides operational and heater power to the RFG. Another function of the harness is to send command, status, RF signals to and from RFG. SASA package was attached to the sidewall inside the payload bay of Atlantis during the ascent to the ISS. It was transferred from the payload bay to the Zenith 1 truss for installation as a spare by Spacewalkers Foreman and Satcher performing EVA 1 on November 19. Topic. SpaceX COTS UHF Communication Unit and Crew Command Panel In a MIDIC stowage locker, Atlantis carried the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services COTS Ultra High Frequency UHF Communication Unit Chu Chu, developed by Space Exploration Technologies SpaceX, in collaboration with NASA to the ISS. It will be integrated on the space station in preparation for future SpaceX flights to the orbiting complex. The unit allows for communication between ISS and SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft via a UHF radio. Commands from SpaceX can be forwarded through ISS to Choo Choo and on to Dragon. Similarly, telemetry from Dragon and Choo Choo can be forwarded down through ISS for monitoring by SpaceX and NASA ground-based mission control. The Crew Command Panel CCP, provides feedback about the state of the Dragon vehicle to astronauts aboard ISS. It additionally provides some simple commanding capability to the astronauts to be used during the Dragon approach to ISS. Other items Astronaut Randolph Bresnik carried a scarf worn by the noted American aviation pioneer and author Amelia Earhart. The scarf had been on display at the 99's Museum of Women Pilots in Oklahoma City. Bresnik's grandfather, Albert Louis Bresnik, was the personal photographer for Earhart from 1932 until July 2, 1937 the date of her disappearance. After being returned to Earth, the scarf would be placed in a new display at the museum dedicated to the astronaut's grandfather's photographs. In addition, the official opening toss coin for Super Bowl 44 C. Pre-game. Section for the actual coin toss itself, as well as a football with all of the Pro Football Hall of Fame inductees written on it and various other NFL-related, space-flown memorabilia were flown on STS-129. Mission experiments The crew of Atlantis worked with several short-term experiments during their mission. 
Atlantis also transported new long-term experiments to the space station. At the end of the mission, the shuttle will return some of the completed experiments from the ISS. Short-term experiments included Shuttle Exhaust Ion Turbulence Experiments SEITE. The crew of Atlantis carried out the SEITE burn on Flight Day 11. SEITE uses instrumentation on the Communications, Navigation Outage Forecasting System C, NOFS, satellite for in-situ observations of density and electric field disturbances caused by the Shuttle Orbital Maneuvering System OMS, engine exhaust plume. The scope of the research is to enhance the surveillance of space, real-time characterization, detection and tracking and timely surveillance of high-interest objects. Shuttle ionospheric modification with pulse localized exhaust experiments, Simplex, the crew carried out the Simplex burn on Flight Day 11. The experiment investigates plasma turbulence driven by shuttle exhaust in the ionosphere using ground-based radars. The processes by which chemical releases can produce plasma turbulence are quantified with the Simplex measurements. Plasma turbulence can affect military navigation and communications using radio systems. They can also be used to promote communications by opening radio channels at abnormally high frequencies. New experiments delivered to the space station included Microbe Experiment, an experiment developed by Texas Southern University SU, students in Houston that aims to study how microbes, Escherichia coli and Bacillus subtilis, grow under weightless conditions in space. Students at SU, Center for Bionanotechnology and Environmental Research CBER, will share experimental data with K-12 students nationwide. Visit https colon slash slash web dot archive dot org slash web slash two oh oh nine one two oh four one three five oh two three slash http colon slash slash ww dot su dot edu slash pages slash three six one one dot asp to obtain additional information on the experiment named URC Microbial One or to download fact sheet use Butterflies in Space program, the shuttle carried a suitcase-sized payload holding larvae of painted lady butterflies and monarch butterflies to the space station. Researchers at the University of Colorado in Boulder expect to compare the space caterpillars with butterfly larvae raised on Earth by students from 100 U.S. elementary and middle schools. Visit http colon slash slash www.biodonline.org to follow the ground-based experiment on Earth at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, or to download the Butterflies in Space Free Teacher's Guide for Classroom Use. Advanced Plant Experiments on Orbit Apex Cambium Project, this joint Canadian Space Agency, NASA project aims to help determine the role gravity plays in the formation of reaction wood in trees. Apex Cambium will also carry out a second experiment to detect the effects of stressor in space on gene expression in higher plants. Atlantis transported thousands of the microscopic Kynorhabditis elegans worms that have been sent from the University of Nottingham, UK to the ISS. The worms are expected to suffer similar muscle loss to humans and will be stored inside the Kibo laboratory. They will be used to study the effect of zero gravity on the human body's muscle development and physiology. Several potential treatments for muscle loss will be tested on the creatures and the research findings will pave the way for treatments to be safely tested on astronauts. For a comprehensive list of all STS-129 experiments and more information, see Topic. Mission background and milestones The mission marked 160th NASA manned spaceflight 129th shuttle mission since STS-1 31st flight of Atlantis 31st shuttle mission to the ISS 5th shuttle flight in 2009 104th post-Challenger mission 
16th Post Columbia Mission The STS-129 mission marked NASA's fifth NASA tweet-up, and its first such event ever held during a shuttle launch at Kennedy Space Center in Cape Canaveral, Florida. 100 members of the general public, representing Morocco, New Zealand, the United Kingdom and 21 U.S. states, in addition to the District of Columbia, attended the two-day event and, for a time, the hashtag NASATWEETUP hashtag reached number three on Twitter's trending topics. <laughs> <laughs> Launch window The November 2009 launch window of Atlantis, between November 16 and November 20, was complicated by the launch of the Mini Russian Research Module 2 MRM2, aboard a Soyuz U rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Further conflict was caused by eastern range constraints with two other satellite launches from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, one at the beginning of the shuttle's launch window and the other at the end. The Eastern Range had been reserved on November 14 and 15, 2009, for the launch of the communications satellite Intelsat-14 aboard an Atlas V rocket. A Delta IV rocket carrying a wideband global SATCOM satellite was also expected to lift off on November 19, 2009. On November 10, 2009, MRM-2 was successfully launched, docking with the ISS on the 12th, while on the same day the Delta IV rocket team announced that they had delayed their launch to a future date, allowing the shuttle to gain additional launch opportunities at the end of the window if it required. Atlas V's launch with the Intelsat-14 was scrubbed on the 14th due to a technical issue requiring a rollback. The scrub, lasting more than 24 hours, meant that Atlantis also avoided a possible postponement of its launch slipping into November 17, 2009. Topic. Shuttle processing Atlantis was towed from its hangar in Orbiter Processing Facility 1 to the Vehicle Assembly Building VAB, on October 6, 2009 at about 7 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time. The move, known as rollover, was completed at 8.25 when Atlantis arrived in the VAB transfer aisle. Atlantis was initially scheduled to roll out to Launch Pad 39A on October 13, 2009. However, an issue with a crane that was being used to transfer Atlantis for attachment to its external fuel tank and two solid rocket boosters caused a delay in operations forcing the shuttle managers to add extra 24 hours to the rollout preparations. Atlantis rolled out from the VAB to the launch complex 39A on October 14, 2009, at 6.38 Eastern Daylight Saving Time in a slow drive on the top of the crawler transporter. The 3.4 miles .5 kilometers rollout was completed with the launch platform secured in place at about 13.31 Eastern Daylight Saving Time The final flight readiness review FRR, meeting for the STS-129 mission took place at Kennedy Space Center during the last week of October 2009. The FRR had approved the installation of a special minicam pointing out of Window 4 on Atlantis flight deck. The camera will film the forward portion of the external tank during the shuttle's ascent to orbit, in order to capture the behavior of the LO-2 ice frost ramps IFRs, located on the upper part of the tank during potential liberation events. NASA managers held a post-news conference to brief about the outcomes of the FRR on October 30, 2009. The briefing was broadcast on NASA TV and was attended by William Gerstenmaier, NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Michael Moses, Launch Integration Manager, Space Shuttle Program and Michael Lineback, Space Shuttle Launch Director. Mr. Gerstenmaier and Mr. Moses mentioned about two issues related to ongoing shuttle processing that had been discussed during the FRR, one, effects of vibrations and acoustics associated with the main engine ignition, 
a potential issue with a stinger bolt structure on the aft of the shuttle, which may be susceptible to the stresses of main engine ignition. 2. Shuttle's toilet, a new aluminum bracket used to help anchor the toilet to the crew module structure had been installed. For future fights, NASA plans to use a redesigned titanium bracket. The payload for the mission was moved to Launch Pad 39A on the October 29, 2009, and was installed into the shuttle's payload bay on November 4, 2009. During the post-flight interview on November 16, Shuttle Launch Director Mike Lineback told that Atlantis officially beat Shuttle Discovery on the record low amount of interim problem reports, with a total of just 54 listed since returning from the STS-125. He continued to add, It's due to the team and the hardware processing. They just did a great job. The record will probably never be broken again in the history of the Space Shuttle program, so congratulations to them. Topic. Launch preparations Final launch preparations commenced at Pad 39A with technicians closing Atlantis payload bay doors during the morning hours on November 13, 2009. On the same day, NASA's official launch countdown clock began at 1 p.m. and the crew flew to Kennedy's shuttle landing facility in a shuttle training aircraft Gulfstream 2 jet at 12.35 Eastern Standard Time to prepare for the launch. On November 14, 2009, after the L-2 Mission Management Team MMT, meeting, Space Shuttle Launch Integration Manager Michael Moses announced that the MMT gave the official go for Atlantis's launch on Monday, and Hobau and Wilmore practiced landings in the shuttle training aircraft. On the evening at about 5.30 p.m. the rotating service structure that protects the shuttle from adverse weather conditions was rolled back anticipating next day's launch. The MMT again met at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time on November 16, 2009 and gave a go to begin loading shuttle Atlantis external tank. The tanking began at 5.03 Eastern Standard Time and was completed at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. The final unanimous go for launch directive from the mission management team, mission control and the launch team came during the countdown clock holding at T9 minutes. The initial launch day weather forecast called for a 90% chance of favorable launch conditions. As the launch preparations continued, due to lower cloud cover ceilings it was changed to 70% and at liftoff to 80%. Topic. Mission timeline Topic. November 16 – Flight Day 1 launch Atlantis launched on time at 14.28 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, 19 hours 28 minutes and 10 seconds Coordinated Universal Time, with launch commentator George Diller's words upon launch being, "...liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, on a mission to build, re-supply and to do research on the International Space Station." Powered flight conformed to the standard timeline, see Space Shuttle, Mission Profile, Launch, with Main Engine Cutoff, MECO, occurring at 8 minutes and 24 seconds Mission Elapsed Time, MET, and the external tank separating from the shuttle at 8 minutes and 38 seconds MET into the flight. A further boost from the Orbital Maneuvering System, OMS, engines was not required due to the nominal MECO and Atlantis settled into its planned preliminary orbit. A subsequent NC-1 engine firing adjusted the orbital path of the shuttle to the ISS, by altering the shuttle's velocity, resulting in a new orbit of 147 by 118 statute miles. At the post-launch news conference, NASA officials reported that three foam events were seen in the external fuel tank ET, video camera footage. They further quoted that the events weren't a concern since the foam loss events occurred after the aerodynamic sensitive time period. 
Later in the day, based on a quick look review of the launch video, crew communicator Capcom astronaut Christopher Ferguson also informed the shuttle crew that there were no ascent debris events of concern. Flight Day 1 on orbit operations included opening of the both payload bay doors of Atlantis at 2112 Greenwich Mean Time, deploying the radiators, deploying Ku band antenna to gain favorable communications, opening of the protective doors covering the star trackers on the nose of the shuttle, setting up the onboard computer network, downlinking imagery and data collected during the flight into orbit, getting out of their launch and entry spacesuits, and stowing away the mission specialist seats. The crew also completed a thorough checkout of the shuttle's robotic arm earlier in preparation for the survey of Atlantis wing leading edge panels and nose cap on flight day 2. Some of the crew started their sleep period around 9.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time about an hour or so later than originally planned. Topic. November 17 – Flight Day 2 TPS Survey The crew members aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis began their first full day in space at 9.28 Coordinated Universal Time. The day was primarily devoted to inspect Atlantis's thermal protection system to look for any signs of launch damage. Using the shuttle's robotic arm and the Orbiter Boom Sensor System OBSS, the crew performed a six-hour inspection of the reinforced carbon nose cap and wing leading edge panels of the shuttle. After releasing its grasp on the inspection boom, the robotic arm grappled the Express Logistics Carrier 1 as a preparatory step for installation on Flight Day 3. The images and video from the Thermal Protection System survey would be reviewed by the image analysis team on the ground. During the day's Mission Management Team MMT briefing, Chairman Leroy Kane noted that a preliminary assessment of ascent imagery and data beamed down during the thermal protection inspection showed no signs of any significant heat shield damage. The crew also made progress to dock with the space station on Flight Day 3. The mission's spacewalkers worked inside the MIDIC to test and ready the spacesuits that would be used during the spacewalks. The crew extended the ring of the orbital docking system in preparation for link-up with the ISS. Commander Charles Hobau also installed the docking system's centerline camera that was used during the rendezvous with the station in the docking port. Two rendezvous burns were performed NC2 and NC3 on the path to reach the station. The NC-2 burn was scheduled for earlier in the day and once again Atlantis reaction control jets were fired for NC-3 burn later in the day. The NC-3 burn lasted for 12s. <laughs> November 18 – Flight Day 3 docking Atlantis crew awoke at 9.28 Coordinated Universal Time and began the rendezvous operations two hours into the day. Guided by a series of maneuvers, NH, NC4 and the terminal insertion burns to refine the shuttle's trajectory, Atlantis closed in on the space station. Before the shuttle docked STS-129 Commander Charles Hobau performed what is known as the Rendezvous Pitch Maneuver RPM, beginning at 1552 Coordinated Universal Time above the Atlantic Ocean, while station astronauts Nicole Stott and Jeffrey Williams photographed Atlantis belly with handheld digital cameras equipped with 400 and 800 mm lenses as part of post-launch inspections of the heat shield. The photos were down-linked to Mission Control for review. The pitch maneuver was completed at 16.01 Coordinated Universal Time. Docking to Harmony, pressurized mating adapter 2 occurred a couple of minutes ahead of schedule at 16.51 Coordinated Universal Time. The joined spacecraft were orbiting 220 miles above Earth at the time of docking, above Australia and Tasmania. After leak checks, the hatchway between Atlantis and the space station was opened at 1828 Coordinated Universal Time. The traditional welcome ceremony and the station safety briefing followed, and shuttle and station crews began their joint operations for the rest of day. 
the astronauts worked to move the spacewalking suits carried up on Atlantis over to the Quest airlock for use in the EVAs. After the hatch opening, astronaut Nicole Stott's tenure as a Station Expedition 21 flight engineer came to an end as she joined the Atlantis crew. Later in the day at 1952 Coordinated Universal Time, Shuttle's robotic arm operated by mission specialists Melvin and Bresnik lifted the Express Logistics Carrier 1 which it had grappled on flight day 2 out of the payload bay. After handing over to the station's Canadarm2 controlled by shuttle pilot Wilmore and station flight engineer Williams, the carrier was attached to the ISS's Port 3 truss at 2127 Coordinated Universal Time mission specialists Michael Foreman and Robert Satcher spent the night in the Quest airlock as part of the overnight campout procedure to help them get prepared for next day's spacewalk. During the post-MMT briefing Leroy Kane noted that the shuttle continues to perform flawlessly with no significant problems to report. Furthermore, he added that NASA is not tracking down any significant issues with Atlantis. Topic. November 19 – Flight Day 4 EVA 1 The wake-up call from the Mission Control Center in Houston went up to the crew at 9.28 Coordinated Universal Time to begin Flight Day 4. Earlier in the morning, Mission Control also radioed Commander Charles Hobau with the news that the crew won't need to perform follow-up inspections on Atlantis Heat Shield during a period of time set aside on Flight Day 5. The crew was told to use that deleted time to get ahead with shuttle to station cargo transfers. Later on Thursday, NASA officials said that Atlantis Heat Shield has been cleared for re-entry. The major activity for the day was mission's first spacewalk EVA-1 by astronauts Foreman and Satcher. Foreman, the lead spacewalker wore a suit with solid red stripes while Satcher wore an all-white spacesuit. Inside the space station Atlantis mission specialist Randolph Bresnik choreographed the activities and coordinated communications between the spacewalkers and mission control. Since Foreman and Satcher completed their chores nearly two hours ahead of schedule, planners decided to add a get ahead task, Satcher to lubricate the Kibo robotic arm snares while Foreman to route a LAN cable on Zaria and mate power cables on a patch panel at the S0 truss. Towards the end of EVA-1, while deploying the payload attach system PAR on the Earth-facing side of the starboard 3 truss, the crew had difficulty loosening a bolt and removing a diagonal brace on the PAR. After hammering on a bolt and wiggling the brace, they successfully deployed the PAR and reinstalled the brace. The spacewalk marked 228th spacewalk conducted by U.S. astronauts, the 134th in support of space station assembly and maintenance, 106th spacewalk out of the space station, the fourth for Foreman and the first for Satcher. The focus of other Atlantis crew members was mostly on supporting the spacewalk or related activities. Nicole Stott celebrated her 47th birthday in space. The astronauts went into their sleep period at 028 Coordinated Universal Time on November 20, 2009 as planned, however they were awakened at 136 Coordinated Universal Time due to a false alarm indicating a sudden depressurization. After checks on the ground and in orbit, flight controllers in Houston, Europe and Russia concluded the station was safe and the crews were not in danger. To make up for the sleep they lost reacting to the alarm, crew sleep period was extended by 30 minutes. <laughs> November 20 – Flight Day 5 Internal Transfers Atlantis crew awoke at 9.28 Coordinated Universal Time. Just after 12.00 UTC, Atlantis Commander Charles Hobau and Mission Specialist Leland Melvin used the shuttle robotic arm to grasp the Express Logistics Carrier ELC-2, located in Atlantis Payload Bay, internal shuttle to station transfer of material kept the crew members busy through Flight Day 5. As a result, well over half the mission's transfer activities were completed. 
Inside the station's Unity node, crew members also completed the two-day task of outfitting the node. They routed a slew of cables, hoses and fluid lines to prepare for the arrival of the Tranquility node aboard STS-130, the next scheduled shuttle mission. Over the course of day, several of the crew participated in chats with media representatives on the ground to answer their questions related to the mission and the experience of being up in space. Shortly after 11 o'clock Coordinated Universal Time, Commander Hobau and Pilot Wilmore talked with CBS News, Fox News Radio and Nashville's WTVG-TV. At 12.28 Coordinated Universal Time, Melvin and Satcher were interviewed by the Tom Joyner Morning Show and at 21.33 Coordinated Universal Time, Hobau, Melvin and Satcher talked with ESPN SportsCenter, Black Entertainment Television News and WRIC-TV in Richmond, Virginia. The crew also got prepared for the mission's second spacewalk on Saturday. These tasks included recharging batteries, switching out Robert Satcher's spacesuit for that of Randolph Bresnik and reviewing procedures. The crew went to their sleep period at 028 Coordinated Universal Time, a half hour later than the station crew. Astronauts Foreman and Bresnik were to spend the night in the Quest airlock as part of the overnight campout procedure. Again, for the second night in a row, fire and depressurization alarms tripped inside the European Columbus module and the Quest airlock woke the Atlantis astronauts. The depressurization alarm triggered automatic procedures that brought the airlock back up to the station's normal pressure of 14.7 psi. Because of time needed to reset various systems, Foreman and Bresnik were informed to forego the normal campout procedure and to sleep wherever they liked, at the station's normal pressure. The flight controllers suspected that the alarms are a result of an unresolved problem with a newly arrived Russian Poisk MRM2 module. <laughs> November 21 – Flight Day 6 EVA 2 30 minutes later than planned, Mission Control Center, Houston sent the crew wake-up call at 8.58 Coordinated Universal Time. The major activity for the day was Mission's second spacewalk, EVA-2, by astronauts Foreman and Bresnik. Because of last night's space station false alarms sounded at 2.53 Coordinated Universal Time, spacewalk was shortened to six hours and delayed the start. Mission Specialist Satcher, serving as the intravehicular crew member helped to direct the spacewalk. The spacewalking pair finished all their assigned work way ahead of timeline with no major problems and completed several get-ahead tasks originally scheduled for the mission's third spacewalk. EVA-2 marked, 229th spacewalk conducted by U.S. astronauts, the 135th in support of Space Station Assembly and Maintenance, 107th spacewalk out of the space station, the 5th for Foreman and the 1st for Bresnik. Also between STS-123 and STS-129, Michael Foreman has completed five spacewalks totaling 32 hours, 19 minutes and placing him 28th on the all-time list. Earlier, at 11.32 Coordinated Universal Time, Atlantis robotic arm operators Leland Melvin and Robert Satcher lifted Express Logistics Carrier 2 out of the shuttle payload bay and handed off to Space Station's robotic arm, Canadarm 2. Just before the beginning of Saturday's spacewalk, at 14.14 Coordinated Universal Time mission specialists Leland Melvin and Nicole Stott operating Canadarm2 mated the carrier to the outboard payload attachment system PAR, on the S3 segment of the space station's main truss. Ground engineers declared that a minor ring misalignment on Atlantis Orbiter Docking System ODS, is of no issue. They cleared the system for undocking and redocking with the space station, a safe haven scenario which would only be initiated in the event Atlantis has to return to the ISS. The docking ring had lost alignment during ring extension on flight day 2. Topic: November 22nd, flight day 7 off duty. 
The crew was awakened at 7:58 coordinated universal time. The day that began with some exciting news from Randolph Bresnik to Mission Control in Houston. Bresnik reported the birth of his daughter Abigail May Bresnik at 17:04 coordinated universal time Saturday. He had got the news by private phone patch through Mission Control shortly after the crew was awakened. Mission Specialist Bresnik is the second astronaut to become a father while in space. The first was astronaut Michael Finke, whose wife gave birth to a baby girl while he was working at the International Space Station in 2004. The crew got a half day off and earlier on the day and discussed their spaceflight with reporters. Astronauts Wilmore and Melvin, Satcher and Stott talked with reporters from WTTG-TV in Washington, D.C., Bay News 9 in Tampa, Florida, and WBBM Radio in Chicago. Wilmore, Melvin and Stott also supported an educational POW TV event with Tennessee Technological University, Cookville, attended by Tennessee students, the president of the university, and Representative Barton Gordon, Democratic Tennessee. The Tennessee Technological University alumnus Wilmore's parents were also present. Some astronauts on both shuttle and station crews worked part time to transfer equipment from the shuttle to the station and back, and to investigate false alarms sounded on Thursday and Friday. Preparations also continued for third and the last spacewalk of the mission. Shuttle crew members as well as the station's crew joined in an hour-long spacewalk procedures review just before bedtime. Satcher and Bresnik prepared tools for the spacewalk, with help from foreman. The two spacewalkers began their campout procedure in the Quest airlock. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> November 23rd, flight day 8 Eva 3. Atlantis crew awoke at 7:28 coordinated universal time. The major activity for the day was mission's third and final spacewalk, Eva 3, by astronauts Satcher and Bresnik. For identification, Satcher wore an all-white spacesuit while Bresnik wore a spacesuit with broken red stripes. Atlantis mission specialist foreman, the intravehicular crew member for EVA-3 choreographed the activities and coordinated communications between the spacewalkers and mission control. Astronauts Melvin and Wilmore operated the station's robotic Canadarm2. The spacewalk started just over an hour later than planned due to Satcher reinserting a valve that became detached in his spacesuit drink bag. The bag is contained in the spacesuit and allows spacewalkers to sip water throughout their activity. Working ahead of schedule most of time, the two mission specialists completed all the primary jobs they were assigned and all the get ahead work that was added to their timeline. EVA 3 marked, the 230th conducted by U.S. astronauts, the 136th in support of space station assembly and maintenance, totaling 849 hours, 18 minutes and the 108th spacewalk out of the space station, totaling 662 hours, 3 minutes. It was also the second for both Satcher and Bresnik. The role of other Atlantis and Space Station crew members were mostly on supporting the spacewalk and completing cargo transfers between the shuttle and the ISS. Station Commander De Winner and STS-129 Mission Specialist Melvin shut down and packed the broken urine processor assembly, distillation assembly and then transferred it to the shuttle for stowage on the MIDIC. De Winner working with STS-129 Commander Hobau afterwards, terminated the transfer of nitrogen gas from Atlantis to the ISS. <laughs> November 24 – Flight Day 9 Hatch Closure The crew woke at 6.58 Coordinated Universal Time. Earlier on the day, Atlantis astronauts used the maneuvering thrusters of the shuttle to boost the space station to a slightly higher orbit. This 27-minute maneuver changed the station's velocity by 2.5 feet per second and raised its orbit by about 1.5 kilometers (0.93 miles). Final internal transfers continued throughout the day. 
around 1,400 pounds of water from Atlantis to the space station was handed over. During five days of joint work, the crews also transferred 2,100 pounds of to be returned experiments and items. Inside ISS, around 12 o'clock Coordinated Universal Time, a false smoke and fire alarm triggered by the Japanese Kibo Laboratory sounded for about four minutes. Mission Control in Houston concluded that stirred up dust particles due to transfer operations aboard the station might have sounded the alarm. This was the third false station alarm during the STS-129 mission. The two previous alarms originated in the new Russian Poisk module. Atlantis and the station crews also joined together for a traditional news conference with reporters at NASA centers, Mission Control in Russia and Canada, and TF1 Evening News in France. The interactive event was aired live at 1300 Coordinated Universal Time. During the news conference, Expedition 21 astronaut Robert Thursk said, The space station now is nearly complete. The station is currently about 86% complete. Aboard the Destiny Laboratory at 1500 Coordinated Universal Time shortly after a joint crew photo, Frank de Winner, the first European Space Agency commander of the space station handed over his command to astronaut Jeffrey Williams. The change of command ceremony was the first of its kind command handover during a shuttle mission on the ISS. Just after the ceremony, Atlantis crew members began a two-hour, off-duty period. At 1743 Coordinated Universal Time, Atlantis astronauts bid farewell to the station's crew inside the Harmony module and crossed the threshold into the shuttle. The hatches between Space Shuttle and the International Space Station were closed at 18:12 Coordinated Universal Time in preparation for the Atlantis undocking. The hatch closure ended five days, 23 hours, and 44 minutes of joint time between Atlantis and the station crews. Atlantis crew used their first hour separated from the station crew to get ready for undocking. They checked out rendezvous tools and set up a centerline camera and carried out leak checks on the Orbiter Docking System ODS. Topic: <laughs> November 25th Flight Day 10 Undocking. Shuttle crew members were awakened at 6:29 Coordinated Universal Time. Undocking operations began about an hour before the separation of the shuttle and the space station. The two spacecraft undocked at 9.53 Coordinated Universal Time. The total dock time was 6 days, 17 hours and 2 minutes. After undocking, Wilmore piloted Atlantis to a point about 450 feet ahead of the station, then, began a flyaround. Once the flower round was completed, Atlantis performed separation burns to increase the distance between the shuttle and the ISS and left the space station complex area at about 10.36 Coordinated Universal Time. During a routine flush out of the shuttle waste water tank Wednesday morning, the astronauts ran into a problem. Mission Control noticed a reduction in the flow from the nozzle that vents the waste water into space. The tank can hold 165 pounds of liquid waste and the crew only managed to get it down to about 80 pounds. Later in the day, astronauts used the camera on Orbital Boom Sensor System OBSS, to survey the condition of the nozzle. Since no ice was found, flight controllers told the crew that it is likely that there is a blockage in the line. Standard late inspections of the thermal protection system took place later on flight day 10. About 12.15 Coordinated Universal Time, Wilmore and Melbourne began grappling and unbathing the OBSS for the survey of the shuttle's heat shield. With help from Bresnik, they inspected the reinforced carbon carbon of the right wing leading edge, then the nose cap and the left wing leading edge. The inspection tasks took more than five hours. Topic. November 26 – Flight Day 11 – End of Mission Prep 
The crew was awakened at 6:28 coordinated universal time for their final full day in space. STS-129 was the eighth shuttle mission in history to mark the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday up in space and the second time for Atlantis. The first time for Atlantis was during STS-61B mission in 1985. The first big news of the day is that our TPS, the Thermal Protection System has been cleared for entry said STS-129 Entry Flight Director Brian Lunney early during in the day's mission status briefing. Later, he also mentioned that, "...Atlantis is in great shape, the crew is in great shape ready for de-orbit tomorrow." The crew spent time stowing items in the shuttle's cabin in preparation for the return to Earth. Cabin stowage started at 8.48 Coordinated Universal Time. Atlantis crew tested shuttle's re-entry systems. Commander Hobau and pilot Wilmore, with help from mission specialist Bresnik checked out the Flight Control System FCS. Immediately afterwards, at 10.58 Coordinated Universal Time, the astronauts test fired Reaction Control System RCS, thrusters. The RCS thrusters control the shuttle's orientation as it descends and begins its re-entry through the atmosphere. All astronauts gathered for a deorbit briefing a little after 11 o'clock Coordinated Universal Time, just before their midday meal. The Thanksgiving dinner aboard Atlantis was more traditional than expected. Earlier in the day, astronauts carried out the Shuttle Exhaust Ion Turbulence Experiments (SEITE) burn. The burn was radial down, nose to the Earth, such that the burn plume was observed by the orbiting C-NOFS satellite. Later, the shuttle ionospheric modification with pulse localized exhaust experiments, simplex burn was conducted, with the burn plume observed by the Arecibo ground station. All seven crew members took a break at 1313 Coordinated Universal Time for a 20-minute talk with news media representatives. During the chat they took questions from ABC Radio, WTVT-TV in Tampa and KCBS in Los Angeles. After setup on the mid-deck of a recumbent seat for Nicole Stott and stowage of the Ku band antenna used for high data rate communications during the mission at 1934 Coordinated Universal Time. Topic: November 27th, Flight Day 12 Reentry and Landing. The shuttle crew awoke Friday at 5:28 coordinated universal time. With weather looking good at the Kennedy Space Center and nothing standing in the way of landing, flight director Brian Lunny gave the go signal to close the payload bay doors at 10:52 coordinated universal time. Mission control also instructed the astronauts to begin fluid loading, a protocol that aids the astronauts' readjustment to gravity. The crew strapped into their seats at 12.37 Coordinated Universal Time in preparation for a landing. NASA operators gave the go for the deorbit burn and at 13.37 Coordinated Universal Time, flying upside down and backwards above the southern Indian Ocean just west of Indonesia, Atlantis fired its orbital maneuvering system OMS engines for 2 minutes and 47 seconds. The deorbit burn decelerated the orbiter by about 211 miles per hour, enough to lower its orbital perigee into the upper atmosphere. Atlantis encountered the first traces of Earth's atmosphere, known as entry interface, at 1412 Coordinated Universal Time at an altitude of 399,000 feet flying over the Pacific Ocean. At 1426 Coordinated Universal Time, 18 minutes before touchdown, the orbiter was traveling at Mach 22, 9 minutes later the orbiter was gliding at Mach 6. The shuttle's ground track took it along the east coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, across the Gulf of Mexico and across the Florida coast south of Fort Myers. 
Atlantis main landing gear wheels touched down at 9 hours 44 minutes and 23 seconds am est 14 hours 44 minutes and 23 seconds coordinated universal time on runway 33, followed by the nose wheel at 9 hours 44 minutes and 36 seconds am est 14 hours 44 minutes and 36 seconds coordinated universal time. The shuttle's wheels stopped at 9 hours 45 minutes and 5 seconds am est 14 hours 45 minutes and 5 seconds coordinated universal time. This was the 72nd Space Shuttle landing at Kennedy Space Center. As the shuttle rolled to a halt, Commander Hobau announced, Houston, Atlantis, wheels stop. Capcom Christopher Ferguson replied the crew. Roger, wheels stopped, Atlantis, that was a picture-perfect end to a top fuel mission to the space station. Everybody, welcome back to Earth, especially you, Nicole." Atlantis had two opportunities to land on November 27, 2009, with two more on November 28, 2009 all targeting Kennedy Space Center. If the November 27, 2009 landing was waved off for some reason, the shuttle had consumables on board to allow Atlantis to remain in space until November 30, 2009. After working through the checklists to safely power down the orbiter for about an hour, the crew got out of Atlantis and into the crew transport vehicle. Exiting the vehicle without stop, they performed the traditional walk around of the shuttle and met with employees from NASA. Speaking briefly to the press following the walk around, Commander Hobau said, We really had truly an amazing mission. He went to add, We had no hitches. It was not us, it was not any single group, but it was just an incredible team from all around the nation. Post-landing crew conference was held later in the day. Five STS-129 astronauts attended the conference. Mission specialists, Randolph Bresnik and Nicole Stott were absent. Bresnik had flown home right away aboard a NASA training jet to be with his wife and new baby daughter. Stott was to take up standard medical checkups after her 91 days in space aboard the International Space Station. Later in the afternoon around 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a service convoy started towing Atlantis from the runway back to Orbiter Processing Facility Bay 1. The crew members flew back to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston on the following Saturday. On November 30, 2009 they received the traditional Houston homecoming celebration at nearby Ellington Field. Topic. Spacewalks Topic. Wake up calls NASA began a tradition of playing music to astronauts during the Gemini program, which was first used to wake up a flight crew during Apollo 15. Each track is specially chosen, often by their families, and usually has a special meaning to an individual member of the crew, or is applicable to their daily activities. Topic. Mission insignia The STS-129 mission patch was designed by Tim Gagnon and Dr. Jorge Kartz. The rather unusual shape of the patch resulted from the crew's desire for the patch to signify the mission's payload two express logistics carriers providing equipment ensuring the longevity of the ISS. The insignia incorporates a number of design elements not typically incorporated into a single patch, the Sun, Moon, Mars, NASA's astronaut symbol ascending on red, white and blue stripes symbolizing the all-U.S. crew, the ISS, the shuttle orbiter and the continental United States representing the major U.S. centers supporting the space shuttle program. The 13 stars on the patch represent the crew members' children, and the Moon and Mars represent the future of space exploration. The names of the crew members are denoted on the outer band of the patch. See also 
2009 in spaceflight List of human spaceflights List of International Space Station spacewalks List of Space Shuttle missions List of spacewalks 2000-2014 List of African-American astronauts <laughs>